Good day everyone. I hope you're all doing well. In this lecture, we introduce a new class of functions. So far, all the functions we've encountered in our calculus courses are real valued functions of real numbers. Meaning, they take in real numbers as input and return real numbers as output. Today, we'll discuss functions whose outputs are vectors, hence the term vector valued functions. These functions will be used to describe curves in three dimensional space. In the next few lectures, we will study the calculus on these functions and study some geometric properties of the curves that they define. At the end of this course, as an application, we will use these tools to quantitatively describe a particle's motion in space say, its speed and direction at any instant, how sharp its path bends, and the distance it travels. I should mention that if you have a PDF copy of the slides for this lecture, the animations do not work on mobile versions of PDF readers. So, at some point, I hope you can view the document on a desktop or a laptop computer. Or you can just refer to this video. First, we recall a concept introduced in the third part of this course. If x and y are given by the functions f and g of the parameter t, then as the value of t increases, the ordered pair x, y also varies, tracing out curve in the plane. In this diagram, the arrowheads indicate the direction in which the curve is traced. They will extend this notion to curves in R3. Suppose this time that x, y, and z are given as functions of fourth variable t, which we call a parameter. By the equations, x equals f of t, y equals g of t, and z equals h of t. Then, as t varies, then the ordered triple x, y, z also varies, tracing out a curve which we call a parametric curve in R3 or space curve. Now, as in the plane case, arrowheads will be used to indicate the orientation of the curve, which by convention we will set to be in the direction of increasing parameter values. Note that if the point x, y, z is on the curve, then there must be a value of t satisfying parametric equations. Such a value of t must then be in each of the domains of f, g, and h. Thus, if there are no indicated restrictions on the value of t, we will allow it to assume any value from the intersection of the domains of f, g, and h. Let's have an example. Consider the parametric equations x equals 1 plus 3t, y equals negative 2 plus 4t, and z equals 3 minus t. Since x, y, and z are all linear functions of t, then t may take on any real number. So let's substitute a few values. For instance, when t equals negative 1, we get x equals 1 minus 3 or negative 2, y equals negative 2 minus 4 or negative 6, and z equals 3 minus negative 1 or when t equals 0, we get x equals 1, y equals negative 2, and z equals 3. When t equals 1, we get x equals 1 plus 3, or 4, y equals negative 2 plus 4, or 2, and z equals 3 minus 1, or 2. And when t equals 2, we get x equals 7, y equals 6, and z equals 1. Let's try to plot these points in a three-dimensional coordinate system. D equals negative 1, we have the point negative 2, negative 6, 4. And D equals 0, we have the point 1, negative 2, 3. When D equals 1, we get the point 4, 2, 2. And when t equals 2, we get 7, 6, 1. Now it appears that the points are collinear. In fact, the graph is the line passing through these points. Indeed, I hope you recognize the 
parametric equations of this form from the previous lecture on lines and planes in three-dimensional space. In particular, in particular, these given equations are the parametric equations of a line passing through the point with coordinates 1, negative 2, 3, and parallel to the vector with components 3, 4, negative 1. The arrowheads indicate the direction of increasing parameter. Now, if the parameter t is restricted to the closed interval a, b, then the point obtained at t equals a is called the initial point of the parametric curve, while the point obtained at t equals b is called its terminal point. For instance, let's take the parametric equation in the previous example and restrict t to the closed interval 0 to 2. Then we obtain a portion of the line in the previous example. In particular, as we saw in the previous slide, when t equals 0 and t equals 2, we obtain the points 1, negative 2, 3, and 7, 6, 1, respectively. This gives us the line segment directed from the point 1, negative 2, 3 to the point 7, 6, 1. Now, as with plane curves, there are multiple ways to parameterize a space curve. For example, in example 1, we may choose a different point on the line as a reference point. Since 7, 6, 1 is also on the line, then another set of parametric equations for the line consists of x equals 7 plus 3t, y equals 6 plus 4t, and z equals 1 minus t. Of course, this time the correspondence between the parameter values and the points on the line will be different. Now, we also learned in our study of plane parametric curves that replacing t by negative t reverses the orientation of the parametric curve. Thus, x equals 1 minus 3t, y equals negative 2 minus 4t, and z equals 3 plus t are also parametric equations for the same curve. This time, the curve is oriented in the opposite direction. We may also replace t by a multiple of t to change the rate to which the curve is being traced. In example 2, if we replace t by 2t, then we obtain the parametric equations x equals 1 plus 6t, y equals negative 2 plus 8t, and z equals 3 minus 2t. In this case, the curve is traced twice as fast. So we expect a shorter t interval to, to trace out the line segment. The value of t, uh, note that the endpoints from the previous slide are 1, negative 2, 3, and 7, 6, 1. Now the value of t in the second set of parametric equations that gives the endpoint 1, negative 2, 3 is t equals 0. While the value of t giving the endpoint 7, 6, 1 is t equals 1. Therefore, the second set of parametric equations yields the line segment as t varies from 0 to 1. Let's have another example. Consider the parametric equations x equals cosine t, y equals sine t, and z equals t. The domain of the cosine and sine functions is a set of real numbers. Therefore, here, t is allowed to take on any real number. And let's substitute some special values. For instance, when t equals pi over 6, we get x equals cosine pi over 6 or square root of t over 2, y equals sine pi over 6 or 1 half, and z equals pi over 6. Let's plot the points in a three-dimensional coordinate system. Note that in this diagram, we scaled z differently from x and y. So when t equals 0, we have the point 1, 0, 0. When t equals pi over 6, we have square root of 3 over 2, 1 half pi over 6. When t equals pi over 4, we have square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, pi over 4. We have the point 1 half, square root of 3 over 2, 
pi over 6, 0, 1, pi over 2, negative 1, 0, pi, 0, negative 1, 3, pi over 2, and 1, 0, 2, pi. We have then that the curve looks as follows as t varies from 0 to 2 pi. Observe that as t increases, z also increases, so that the curve moves up relative to the xy plane as t increases. Observe as well that as t increases, the curve winds around the z axis. This is because x equals cosine t and y equals sine t is a parametrization for the circle with equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Thus, if one projects these points onto the xy plane, we find that as t increases, the point goes around the unit circle in the counterclockwise direction. Combining this repeated revolution with the rise is z as t increases, and as a result, we obtain a curve that spirals upward, forming this curve which uh, resembles a stretched spring. Formally, we call it a helix or a circular helix, and you might and you might recognize this shape from models of DNA molecules. If you're not familiar, the structure of a DNA molecule consists of two helical chains of nucleotides that coil around each other.